before we begin in earnest, let us uh, kindly ask for your patience for just a, a few more minutes to let people join the webinar. We will start in, in three minutes sharp. Great. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, this nice webinar of the Stop TV's focus group on AI-based imaging in TV. Um, and today we're gathered here to um, to learn and exchange knowledge and insight regarding the utilization of this cutting edge technology in the fight against TV. This has been a series of webinars uh, that provides a useful platform for sharing and learning from early uh, implementing partner uh, with their experience of using ultra-portable X-ray and computer-aided detection software in mostly high burden country. Today, um, we're pretty happy to see that more and more country are recognizing the potential of ultra-portable X-ray and CAD um uh, in the fight against TB. With this surging in demand, uh, an array of X-ray provider have emerged uh, and each contributing to the diversity of uh, the innovation in the field. Today we uh, are fortunate to uh, be in the company of a speaker who brings a unique insight and first-handed experience, uh, um, using uh, one lesser known yet also uh, useful and impactful X-ray called Min X-ray. Um, not only uh, it, it's new, but the integration model with QXR is seamless, the most seamless integration. And it's the first uh, project that has utilized uh, the combination of the two brand products in the world. So um, and before we get into it, I just wanted to quickly uh, go back to uh, the principle of this uh, series of webinar is to be very interactive. So we, we want to, we hope you also will take this opportunity to engage in open discussion, in asking questions and contribute your experience and knowledge. Uh, so we encourage you all to participate actively you can raise your hand uh, uh, at the open uh, 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 Q&A session after the presentation. You can also leave your question or comment in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat box. Um, and uh, as a housekeeping, 
we will be recording, we have already started recording on the webinar and we will be posting this on our website and send you the link to access the recording. Same with the pres presentation slides. Um, you will have access to them after the call in a few days. All right, so without further ado, um, uh, on behalf of Stop TV, I would like to uh, extend my warm invitation to all the participants. Um, to uh, uh, Stephen John, the uh, executive director of Jana Health Foundation in, in Nigeria. He will lead us on a journey uh, through his experience using uh, ultra port of X-ray and CAD in Northern Nigeria. The floor is yours, Stephen. Um, thank you very much, uh, Zizhen, and uh, also to the team at Stop TV Partnership. Uh, definitely without your support, there is no way we will have uh, anything to share because our story has always been uh, uh, through supports that come from you to actualize our dreams of making sure that we get people to know what is happening in this special population and how we can solve the problem. So I'm presenting on behalf of Jana Health Foundation on our experiences with this uh, portable chest x-ray device screening communities in Northeast Nigeria. I uh, have this outline here. I will start by giving a background. Then we'll look at the program planning, screening algorithm, the threshold uh, score and operational setup, ultra portable X-ray system image quality, interoperability with health information system, then data storage and privacy. We'll also look at the result that we have and the success stories and scaling up and our experience with the X-ray and CAD vendor then challenges and lessons learned, then we'll conclude by dwelling on what should be done differently next time. Jana Health Foundation was established in 2012 and we focus on TB prevention and care among key and vulnerable populations, mainly in Northeast of Nigeria. So we've worked for over 10 years now and the populations that we work among mostly are nomadic pastoralists, internally displaced persons and refugees. We have a presence in five of the six northeastern states of uh, Nigeria, and our headquarters is in Adamawa State, Yola, and we have project offices in these states. JHF works with a pool of over 400 volunteers, and what is interesting is, of course, we pool our volunteers from the targeted communities that we intervene. The use of uh, ultra portable X-ray CAD devices to ATB diagnosis started a few years ago in Nigeria, but for Jana Foundation, we started in 2022. So we started a nomadic community screening with this particular equipment at the end of the second quarter of 2022. Our targeted key and vulnerable populations, in this case, the nomadic pastoralists, have little or no access to health services and are often very distrustful of them because of uh, uh, exploitation that has taken place over the years. Previous screenings have been mostly symptom-based, as most of us know already, and the results that have been achieved over time show that up to 40% of TB cases may be among these key and vulnerable populations, especially the nomadic pastoralists. Poor access to chest X-ray machine and radiologists is also a huge problem in the, in the states that we operate, and uh, the situation worsens because uh, definitely this is linked to the diagnosis of clinically diagnosed TB cases without X-ray, then we, we have problems. So we have no experience with custom clearance, but we're able to achieve, uh, to get ethical clearance from the states in which we operate. So JHF procured just one mean X-ray impact system with fully integrated Q-Track version three for artificial intelligence. We have teams that we trained, we trained in total three teams, to conduct this particular exercise across the states. And uh, a team is made up of a registration officer, a data, data entry staff, radiographer, and a coordination officer. So these four people are what make a, a team. So we train three of such. So let me take us through the processes that are also involved in this intervention. First is the nomadic communities have to be mapped. The community leaders have to be identified and engaged. And of course, we came up with an advocacy plan and then implemented that plan. So if you look at the right side of the screen, you will see a map of cattle root, which we obtained from the Ministry of Livestock and the, in the Adamawa State uh, Government. So this ministry is in charge with vaccination of cattle 
and they know where the communities and the resting points and the grazing reserves of nomadic pastoralists are. So we had to collaborate in order to know where these people are so that we can intervene. And below that, the map, you will see the picture of our community advocacy and engagement. You can see our staff who is also uh, from the nomadic uh, communities raising awareness about TB among community leaders in one of the sittings. So community mobilization and screening led by nomadic focal points and local government supervisors were conducted. This was followed by active screening in nomadic communities. And then, presumpt and then this screening, of course, is made up of a barrage of activities from the identification of presumptive TB cases to sputum collection, transportation, result retrieval, and active linkage to TB care. What is also important is that the result sharing has become a very important component of this particular intervention. And this is why the nomadic people, uh, we have a very good acceptance among the nomadic people because they are always waiting to hear what is the outcome of the screening. And we are able to do that during our strategic advocacy visits. So the program planning. Our main X-ray impact system equipment is very portable and easy to use, easy to set up, user-friendly. It is made up of a few components. Uh, first is the generator, and the next is the DR panel, and then it has a laptop uh, that is connected with it. In that laptop, you have the Q-Track software. It is completely wireless with two light tripods, very easy to carry. It takes like three minutes to set up. And in a day, assuming you have the whole working hours of eight, you could shoot up to 200 images, depending on the location. For us, we travel an average of two hours to access the nomadic community. So this shortens the time that we have for screening. So we have an average lately uh, of about 100. So there are no additional items that were procured locally. And uh, there's easy access to our manufacturers because when we have any kind of issues, especially at the beginning, uh, in the second quarter, or third quarter of last year, 2022, there are some times that we had to reach back to our, 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 our manufacturers and ask questions about the uploads, which we have difficulties, but at the end, it was the network that was, that was the problem. And sometimes there are some variables also that we wanted to be added to the screening, uh, to the screening system. So here we have our algorithm. So in this algorithm, you will see uh, the, the advocacy and engagement of key and vulnerable population is the first. So after the entire advocacy process and the engagement, it all starts with the mobilization of the community for screening. Now, when, when, when this is done, everybody comes to a registration and symptom screening point. And this is done in order to identify pregnant women and non-consenting adults and then under fives who are excluded. I would like to say here that the acceptance uh, for the screening is 100% among the adults. We have never had an instance where someone did not consent to screening. And we also use this point to identify presumptive TB cases and we document the symptoms so that we can do it, it can help our analysis later. At the end of the whole registration and symptom screening, everybody except those that are excluded are channeled to chest X-ray screening using the ultra portable device. So these are the outcomes from this screening. The first is that we can have a group that are not presumptive uh, TB cases and they do not have lesions and they have a low AI score of zero to 0 0.3, less than 0 0.3. So this group are canceled on TB, discharged or referred. I said referred here because some of the people might have a cardiomegaly or some other abnormalities within their chest wall. So they will need to see a cardiologist or other specialist. Then there's the group that are presumptive TB cases, but have an AI score of less than 0.3. Together with the group that have AI score of 0.3, these groups are registered and one sputum sample is collected from them and passed to, and taken to the gene expert for analysis. The results are retrieved. And for those that are TB cases, they are actively linked to dot centers and enrolled on anti-TB drugs. And for those that are not TB cases, we try our best to make sure we link them to medical officers for further evaluation. Then the fourth group are clans that have lesions, you know, in their, in their chest x-rays. Now, let me pause here and say that after the entire screening exercises, we sit down and look at this particular x-rays, and then we are able to see some of them that have lesions you know, whether, whether they are, the, the AI score is less than 0.3 or more, 
we take it to our radiologists. We identified radiologists who review these x-rays. And out of this, they're able also to come up uh, with diagnosis of TB or not. So about the threshold score selection and equipment setup. A threshold score of 0 0.5 was predetermined in line with general findings and from other studies as well. However, based on our experience in the field, we realized that there are some of our clients that have uh, a, a score of between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 that have lesions. So we decided to start our consideration from 0 0.3. The equipment comes with one protective apron, which is worn by the generator operator, and all the people, the team and the clients stay behind. We have a cutoff uh, distance of two meters, but they stay far beyond this. And our radiologists have confirmed that the images are excellent and very happy to review always because they feel excited to, to come to, to be seen such images compared to what they usually see in their, in their fixed X-ray equipment in the facilities where they work. So on the right, you can see also pictures from the field. These are some members of our team just about to set up and they decided to take these pictures that I thought I should share. Interoperability with health information system. Chest X-ray has a very important role to play in the diagnosis of TB. This we can see in the National Tuberculosis and Leprosy Control Program guidelines. But in this intervention, what is different is where the X-ray is located. If you look at the guidelines of the TB control program, you will see that the X-ray comes after identification of bacteriologically negative presumptive TB cases. But in our case, we're putting the X-ray up front. Diagnosed TB cases are enrolled using the NTBLCP reporting and recording, uh, reporting and recording tools, and the TB cases are enrolled, uh, are enrolled are reflected in the National Health Information System. So which means the entire cases that we have go through the system and they are there captured as all other cases that are detected by the state TB control program. The data generated is stored in cloud, that is for the, for the mean X-ray, and accessed through the QRA QTRAC software. So which means that the issues around data storage in the cloud are relevant, things to do with confidentiality, et cetera. Here are some pictures from the field. You can see a, a group of nomadic people after mobilization, they've set up, they've come out to be screened uh, using the equipment. You can see the last the picture uh, on the bottom right. You can see how long this queue is. That is to tell you that the people are really very interested and they've seen the results of this and a lot of people in the communities who have been found with TB uh, have been placed on treatment and they've recovered, recovered just before their own eyes. So they got very interested and they want to be screened. Here we have also some pictures from the field. What you can see here is how remote the communities where we work are. You cannot access this community with vans. You can, you, can, you can only use motorcycle at some point to take the equipment there. So if the equipment is anything heavier than what it is, then you have a big issue. The last picture on the bottom right is a thank you picture. A few community leaders came out with their families to thank the team after a day's work. So we present to you results of six months of intervention from July, end of July to December of 2022 where we had 66 screening events in 60 uh, nomadic communities. In the total, we had 5,397 persons that are over 15 years screened. 51% of them are fem were females, and then 69% of them were between the ages of 25 and 64. So a total of 1,119 presumptive TB cases were detected. Out of this, we were able to get 85 bacteriologically positive TB cases, which makes up about which is 7.5% of that number. And of these, 42% were females. So what is interesting to note here is that if we take the cutoff point from 0 0.5 of the mean X-ray, you see that we can detect 89% of these bacteriologically cases, uh, positive cases. But if you go down to 0 0.2 with 0 0.3, you know, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, we consider the cutoff one from 0 0.3, we're able to detect 95% of the back positive TB cases. So again, we try to look at what we can do, what can be detected using just cough for two weeks, which is the common thing that applies across all clinics that are that are being that are implementing TB control here. So using cough for two weeks or more, you only end up detecting 40%. 
But if you ask for any cough, just any cough, you will be able to detect uh, 62%. So here you can see clearly the value that this equipment adds to TB case finding. Our success stories, at least we're able to provide access to TB services for the nomadic pastoralists and other key vulnerable populations. And the diagnosis of TB among people without symptoms is also happening because our prevalence survey, I remember a couple of years ago, showed that a high proportion, close to 40% of the clients that were screened that came out to be bacteriologically positive do not have symptoms of TB. So this equipment is able to pick out this from the population. It also reduces the turnaround time for diagnosis of clinical TB. And it also improved TB case notification, more especially the clinically diagnosed cases. Let me say that when we started implementing TB control among these vulnerable populations, especially the nomads, we had over 90% of our cases being bacteriologically positive. We were not able to detect clinically diagnosed TB cases. Now, and you know, that is a huge problem. It shows that clearly we are missing this group. But now with the arrival of this uh, ultra portable uh, chest X-ray equipment, we're able to detect a good number of clinically diagnosed uh, TB cases. And let me say that in the results section, we detected 85 bacteriologically positive cases, but we had 117 clinically diagnosed cases after the entire evaluation of the medical officers and then the radiologist. We're also able to reduce, uh, in, so there's a reduction in the sputum testing requirement because before you can have people just come in without symptoms or with symptoms, getting screened by, the, by, 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 by gene expert. But here you have a selection of those that really need the screening. So at the end of the day, you don't have people that do not need to be, uh, do not need to have their sputum screened. Then the intervention is presently being scaled up. We started with screening all age group in nomadic communities in one state. Now we are working in three states. Up till yesterday, we're just coming from the field where we witnessed, we went to supervise some of the screening activities in a neighboring state. We also are able to use this equipment to provide support for the World TB Day screening in Adamawa State, for example. And I know the other state in the Northeast have always been campaigning, trying to talk to us to bring the equipment, but we only have one. So if we had six, we will have deployed to each of the states and you will see how fast we can control TB in this, in this area. We also uh, provide support for special medical outreaches that is run by government. Sometimes the government here do outreaches and then they heard about this equipment and they ask us to come help them out and we deploy the equipment and they were very happy with the performance of the equipment. The Nigeria Medical Association Week in Adamawa State also benefited uh, strongly from the use of this particular equipment. At the moment, we're targeting minority children in nutritional health facility, uh, health facilities across the three, across three states that we are intervening now. So it's older children. We are not, we are not, we are not, of course, uh, screening uh, less than six years with this particular uh, equipment. So our, from our experience with the use of this particular equipment, I can say that first, the equipment is user friendly. It is very convenient. It is portable. It is very easy to transport and you can set it up in any remote community. You can even hang the DR panel on a tree, even if your tripod is not there. So this is how easy you could use this equipment. And our target communities are so excited about this screening that we have 100% acceptance from all the nomadic communities that we've been screening. There is no single incident of anyone that says he doesn't accept to be screened. Then the vendors have been very, very supportive, like I mentioned earlier. The occasional issues that we had with upload of images, they were able to attend to it quickly. And then, it, of course, introduction of key symptoms into the QQ track, because we sat down and identified key tuberculosis symptoms and made sure that they are included in the Q track system. Then provision of power backup for mean X-ray computer. That was a challenge, but they were able to help us to get a backup for the computer. The computer can only have power for four hours. But where you can work, where, where we work more than four hours, we have issues. But now that they provided the batteries, we don't have any problem. All the other equipment have two batteries and they can screen for over eight hours daily. What are the lessons learned? First, the chest X-ray and AI eased access of remote, hard to reach community to TB services. This was not the case in the past. And it also we also learned that, of course, this equipment as it is can go closer and closer 
into hard to reach areas than larger van based system or any other kind of system you know that is that is placed on a vehicle then it sh we have a shortened time that is taken to diagnose clinical TB among this group now, because once the x-ray has picked that there is a lesion or there's something or the score is high, you see that the, the, the client is, is now motivated more to make sure that he, he, he submits sputum samples and then get tested quickly and of course have access to the outcome. The chest x-ray AI screening led to a reduction in case detection gap. If you look at the profile of case detection in the states that we implemented, you can see clearly how TB case detection has improved, especially the clinically diagnosed TB cases. And there's no need for electricity during screening because we have batteries backup. And then the symptom screening misses many people with bacteriologically positive TB. So the use of this equipment reduces the number of TB cases that are missed. And also chest X-ray and AI reduce testing requirements. It saves cost. And employing AI to read chest X-ray can improve the triaging when human readers are not available. So we have quite a few challenges. The first challenge has been addressed, but I thought I should mention in case some people want to go into this, that the computer needs to have a longer uh, life, I mean, not, not to discharge, you know, so that it can go beyond four hours. That is very important. All the other equipment can give you more than eight hours. Then we had limited access to radiologists. We don't have a lot of them here. My state, that is Adamawa State, we are almost five million. But radiologists here that are working with government as of last year were just two, just two. So, you know, this is a huge problem. So we have to be, we be, be, be seeing how we can go around this. So we established linkage with health facilities uh, uh, where you have uh, radiologists, like the tertiary health facilities, also in neighboring states. Then the inability uh, to use the equipment among under five and pregnant women, I believe the manufacturers and the community that is listening to this are doing something about that. And then the NTP algorithms are not updated yet, but I know that there's need to update this algorithm. And without updating it, we'll continue to miss a huge number of people that have bacteriologically positive TB and are without symptoms. What will we do differently next time? I will say that first, we need to have a strong and well-trained screening team. If you change your team, it could be it could lead to problems because there are processes that are involved in training them so that they get acquainted with the equipment and then also the issue of uh, safety is there then we need to also invest invest more in community engagement and mobilization if you don't get your community well engaged and mobilized you end up going out and spending the whole day screening less than 50 or 30 people because people will not come up so this was a key to our success in this screening then quality assurance is very important. The access to radiologists, we have two radiologists now that are reading, and sometimes when we know that we have a, a conflict, we make sure we take to the other. So we have this kind of system to check on quality. Then there's proper, proper handling of the equipment is needed to avoid damaging, especially during setup. People have to be calm and then set up carefully so that you don't have equipment falling out of your hands. And then unstable power supply is common in this area. So there's, use, there's need to use surge controllers because recently we lost one of our power packs, but thanks to Stop TV partnership and our, our the manufacturers, they were able to quickly mobilize and send us a new uh, uh, power pack to continue our screen. Radiation safety is also important, although it is known that this is not like what we have in the fixed uh, uh, X-ray equipment in the hospitals. But nevertheless, we still need a more protective apron. We feel that the entire team of four people that are working should all have a protective apron. So I would like to acknowledge the Ministry of Health in Adama, Gombe, and Taraba State, also the state TB control teams in the three states, and then most importantly, the National TB Leprosy and Burili Ulcer Control Program. They have been very supportive to this particular intervention and all the other interventions that we are implementing here. Then I can say I can say enough thank you to Stop TB Partnership in Geneva. They, I don't know what to say to them because uh, where we feel we are tired, they make sure that they may motivate us. They make sure that we keep going and we have continued to go and we have seen today the result of what we have done. As I speak now, the screening has reached almost uh, eight, over 8,000 now, but the analysis here is just for those six months where we had close to 6,000. So TB Reach, Challenge Facility for Civil Society, thank you so much for, for what you're doing and we'll continue to do our best to make sure we end TB. Thank you and over to you, Zizhen.
Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen, for giving the amazing presentation. Very informative and lots of questions has already came in uh, in the chat. Uh, so we'll take some question now for, from the chat um, and then feel free to formulate uh, your own inquiry or uh, simply just share uh, if you have similar experience, challenges or lesson learned. Um, please make it as interactive as you can. I know actually there are quite a lot of country implementing partner are, are on the call with different, uh, uh, using different equipment um, at different stages of uh, implementation. So please um, don't, don't hesitate to ask your specific uh, question as well. Um, okay, so without uh, further ado, I'll go look at the uh, first question uh, in the chat. Okay, so the first question is uh, to you, Dr. Steven. Did you offer CXR screening for asymptomatic individuals from key vulnerable populations? In India, we found a significant number of cases that were uh, that may report to be asymptomatic, but end up with a diagnosis of TB. Okay, thank you very much. I hope I got you right. Um, yes, I think uh, going through the literature, what is in India, that is the proportion of people that have TB that are without symptoms is equivalent, is similar to what we had in Nigeria during the prevalence survey. I happened to have led a team, so I saw the information firsthand. So definitely the equipment has been very helpful uh, in picking out this particular group of uh, people uh, that have TB without symptoms. I don't know if I answered the question completely. Yeah, I think also in your algorithm, you, you did offer screening for asymptomatic individuals. So yes, that's uh, pretty yes, clear. Everybody. Everybody except the pregnant women and the under fives, you know, and those that did not consent, of course, uh, was screened. So, yeah. Or oh, maybe I can follow up uh, by asking, is it a parallel? Uh, so everyone in the community receive an x-ray or it's yes. a negative sequential? Meaning those everyone... who have TB, including okay. those who have TB suggested symptom, do they still get x-ray or they go straight to no, if, uh, if someone sorry if someone already has tb of course he doesn't qualify for this but uh every the community members all of them that they, they, they have access that we screen all of them except those that are pregnant and those that are under five but people that are already diagnosed with tb that are on treatment of course no we don't screen this yeah great okay so our next question is from tori uh, did all patients, did all people with a negative uh, expert result and TB presumptive CXR have clinical consultation for potential diagnosis of non-bacteriological uh, um, non TB? Well, uh, we do our best to make sure that we link this group to the medical officers at the facility level. It is not optimal because the communities where we operate are so far away from where the facilities are. But in cases of the communities that are closer to health facilities with doctor, yes, we're able to uh, link them up and make sure that they are, they are screened further. In fact, in some instances, we even use, we transport, we contribute to the transportation of this group of people to the medical officers. Wow. Well, well that's good to know. Thank yeah. you. And the next question is from Ken. Excellent work and clear improvement in active TB case finding. I'm concerned about the people with CXR abnormality that are deep not TB. Are there efforts underway to follow up or refer elsewhere for those patients? Also, the increase in clinical diagnosis of TB is a double-edged sword, uh, as some of these will not have TB diseases. So there's actually two questions. Um, should I repeat the question, Dr. Steven? Yes, please repeat it. I didn't get the first part. The first part is concerning uh, those people with abnormal checks x-ray finding, but it's not TB. Any effort to follow up uh, uh, on, yes. on those patients? Yes, for us, abnormal x-ray could be cardiomegaly, could be any other uh, chest finding. So that is why if the radiologist uh, have a look and he sees that, yes, there is there are no symptoms consistent with TB, but there's, any, uh, there's a symptom like in the imaging of the heart, like unfolding of the iota and some other 
cardiac uh, uh, science and the visuals, then they are linked to, to cardiologists. But we do not follow these ones up to see the outcome. We are not able to do that. And then, of course, uh, in such a setup also, we run a risk of uh, overdiagnosis of a, of a clinical TB. As you can see, 117 uh, people were diagnosed with clinical TB by the radiologists and the medical officers that uh, review them. So that, that, that means what we have as back positive is 42%. You know? So there could be a chance of uh, having an overdiagnosis of clinical uh, TB. Yes, over. Thank you. You yeah, answer both part of the question. The clinical diagnosis it's a it's a known phenomenon. Um yeah, so yeah, you not unique to your project. Our next question is from Oscar. Um, how much did one day cost you? Including transportation, cost of one screening expert a uh, day, and cost of motorcycle use per day, DSA and et cetera. Uh, was it mandatory to a radiologist uh, to have a radiologist present at each x-ray shoot? Did you include a radiologist presence at the screening into the day cost? Okay, first about the cost, we are working on that. I think we're going to have a separate uh, publication on the cost. So I can't say anything about the cost of this uh, intervention right now. But uh, it is not mandatory. We have never had a radiologist present there. But what we had was radiographers on some of the occasions. You know, So it's after the entire screening that we now take the entire system and then go and sit with the radio radiologist to review those x-rays. And then where he picks those that he thinks are presumptive TB cases, then we go back and make sure that we subject, we, we, we get them, I will, we, we give them access to, to, to other tests if it's possible, if it's required, you know, to make a diagnosis of TB. So this is how it works. But we don't have the radiologist going to the field. Like I said, in the entire state, we have two radiologists. Too bad, we'll have to wait for your publication on the cost. So uh, that that is, a lot of people ask this question. All right, so uh, then the next question is from Elizabeth. How do you explain in two weeks of screening low sensitivity? Do you think that people with TB cannot accurately estimate the duration of their cough, cough or these are indeed a short duration cough um, and disease caught early? Sorry, can you take that again? Uh, so this is regarding the sensitivity being low in the group with two weeks cough. Uh, yeah. Why? How do you explain that? Could it be uh, people not accurately recall the duration, um, and, or those are just indeed short duration of cough, uh, cough and, and the disease are caught early? I think uh, this is very important for, for NTPs in particular, because definitely without this before the mean X-ray started coming, this was the way that we are trained to identify TB uh, uh, cases by, by asking for symptoms of two weeks or more. So, but I said earlier that during the prevalence survey, 40, almost 40% 40 of the bacteriologically positive cases that were detected were asymptomatic. And in my experience of, of 20 years or so in, in tuberculosis control, I have seen drug resistant TB cases that had no symptom. So this is the problem. Now with this, you can see that, yes, it is not sensitive to have just two weeks as the, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as the uh, symptom screening of two weeks to, 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 to find TB cases. But once you introduce this mean X-ray, you see that it's able to pick some chest findings that are, might be consistent or something that will prompt us to investigate further. And then you start finding TB cases without symptoms. Over. Thank you. Um, next question from Srini. Why do we need radiologists uh, if uh, AI CAT is used for screening? Uh, in fact, with a 0 0.3 cutoff, you can diagnose almost all TB. Well, uh, we have seen that uh, if we lower the cutoff point to 0 0.3, we're able to find only 95%. First, we're interested in the remaining 5%. To end TB, we must go further. Then number two, uh, it is not only uh, TB. Now, in this case, we have picked quite a number of people that have cardiomegaly, unfolding of the iota, and some other signs that shows hypertension and other disease conditions. 
And we have also seen people that had some, 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 some abnormalities within the chest that is not TB. Now you can see that in this era of integrated service delivery, it is very important to also try to address as much health problems as possible. So the radiologists have been quite helpful and I feel that we'll need them for this particular uh, 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 reason. Go on. Thank you. Just to follow up on this uh, and, and to clarify, um, does that mean when uh, your CAD uh, with QRI actually report on uh, non-TB abnormality like cardiomyopathy, as you mentioned, or yeah. you have the radiologist read all the slides? No, uh, the, the radiologists do not read all the films. What happens is after the entire exercises, we sit down to look at the images and sometimes we find some images that have some lesions or some things we don't understand, even with an AI score of less than 0 0.3 sometimes. So this is just a few. I give you an instance. After three weeks of work in Adamawa State, we, we I think uh, the, the close to three, almost uh, 90 to 100 uh, uh, shots, that is images per day for three weeks we were able to identify about 30, between 30 and 40 of such kind of uh, x-rays, just a few, not much. And then this was what the radiologist attended to before we moved to the next stage. Over. Thank you. So it's still a, a human review of the slides. Yeah. This is not based on the uh, the CAD software that flag, oh, there's a cat cardiomegaly. Correct. Thank you. Um, though our next question is, what's the accuracy of the AI? I suppose you don't have the data on, uh, on you don't have the, do you have the accuracy on the AI that you use? Well, you know, this is the first that uh, we're using. And then from what we have seen on the earlier analysis, uh, from 0 0.3 cutoff point, we're able to pick 95% of bacteriological positive cases. Uh, we, we have not actually compared, I have not compared with other findings from other users of other equipment, similar equipment. So I, I can't say much on this, but what I know is that uh, from our work, we can see that if you cut off point, if the cut off point is from 0 0.3, we can get 95% of the TB cases. Uh, I think it's uh, fairly accurate. Over. Thank you. And similar to the threshold. From Mary, um, how did you basically how did you come up with uh, the the cutoff point? Uh, is it specific to the machine or is it specific to your population? Well, you know uh, there were experiences from similar key and vulnerable populations and other studies. Uh, I believe we were guided to 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 come up to use that cutoff point of zero point five because at the beginning it was zero point five. This was based on findings and other researches elsewhere in similar. Uh, population. But we, we changed a bit because, like I said, we started seeing things uh, at, at between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Then we decided to bring it down on, you know, on our own. So this is this is the story of the cutoff point. Thank you. And I think the next question is also around accuracy. So I'll skip this. Um, and then the next question is regarding safety. Is it safe to take image of the client in an open space? And would be nice if you add your experience regarding how you keep all material safe while traveling. We have, uh, first, it is safe uh, as far as we, we're concerned. We haven't seen any, we've asked questions from experts also about the, the equipment and then they, they've told us uh, it's a low, low dose emission of uh, radiation that uh, beyond two meters, it might not, it, it doesn't have the ability to cause uh, uh, damage like compared to what we have in the in the facilities, you know, the fixed system, which is high dose uh, radiation. So, and uh, there are some studies, that have, I think from Pakistan, where they use uh, the, the, the counter to check the radiation at different distances and the beyond two meters, uh, uh, they couldn't see much of anything to worry about. Then regarding how we carry the equipment, we have a vehicle that we use for that. We make sure that the vehicle has adequate space and the team of four people can also go in that vehicle. So then we have uh, motorcycles across all, you know, we've, we've implemented projects in the Northeast, in the states that we work. So the local government supervisors each have motor motorcycle procured through TB Reach Grant. 
and they are there to complete the journey where the need arises. Over. Thank you so much. Uh, how would um, how do patients get to health facility to take their sputum sample uh, for bacteriological assessment? Do you have a loss to follow up at this stage? We have dedicated community volunteers that have motorcycle and we have our, our containers, sputum containers, and then we're able to get ice packs from the primary health care. We are ready. The supervisor does not come empty handed and the, the, the clients do not go to the facilities themselves. We take sputum, we transport the sputum to the facility, retrieve the results. So when people are positive, they only go to the facility once for registration. In fact, there are a few local government areas that bring the whole document for the registration to the community. And I said earlier at the beginning that we walk through a pool of over 400 volunteers that are pulled from the communities. So in the nomadic communities, we have our volunteers who have been trained years ago and have even been retrained. So they offer treatment support you know, in this particular community to people that come down with TB. There are a number of nomadic people that have TB that go through the treatment till the end and will never see the four walls of a health facility. facility. Over. So does all patient just as follow up, all patient presumptive are able to uh, produce a high quality specimen in the field? Yes, they are able to because uh, in the team that goes to the field, beside the core team, we have the local government supervisor who have been trained on sputum collection, taking deep breath, coughing from within and making sure that they rinse their mouths and all those things. They have been trained already on that. So the supervisors aid, they help the the, the presumptive TB cases to collect uh, quality sputum. And regarding a loss to follow up, I think uh, in my experience again in TB control, the, it's the nomadic community that people think that we will have a loss to follow up, that we did not even have as much to worry about with loss to follow up. The reason is because of the community engagement. You know, like I said earlier, this is a community that is uh, conservative, that is being exploited, that do not like welcome anybody uh, into them easily. So we're able to break that jinx by using people that vaccinate the cattle. And then these are the people that they know and trust. So we go together with them and they link us up and then they submit. And then of course they, they, they do what they are told to do. And having known the dangers of staying, I mean, uh, uh, of not taking treatment of TB, uh, for TB, uh, they, 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 we don't have issue with uh, losses to follow up. It's just few less than less than three percent, I think, from the last data that I reviewed. And, and can you also estimate uh, because this question came out relatively what proportion of the X-ray film that you reviewed uh, or the radiologist has reviewed um, uh, uh, has a different. Uh, um, the diagnosis as the cat stop or you use false negative false positive i don't understand is it uh, like other condition outside of tb tb so okay, you so mentioned when you start you use 0 0.5 but you have noticed there are some false negative under the threshold so you yeah. lower it down yeah um and do you know roughly what proportion when, when you use 0 0.5, roughly how many were false uh, negative? And oh. now uh, with 0 0.3, yes. what proportion of it? Yeah. By, by lowering 5% of them. By lowering to 0 0.3, we got 95% of bacteriologically positive TB. So we gained 10% in between, which means if we had used the cutoff point of 0 0.5, we wouldn't have gotten up to this 95%, about 10% of the back positive cases will be missed. But of course, we have to consider the fact that there's the window for the for the radiologist, which might end up picking some of this. Over. Thank you. And next question from Deborah. Um, this is regarding the algorithm uh, where you still provide x-ray on symptomatic. Um, she's wondering if there's uh, any uh, concern with the increased number of x-ray done and, and the increased cost. Well, these are issues definitely that are up to the, up for discussion regularly, of course. Um, yeah, 
since we have an equipment that uh, we understand is a uh, low dose equipment, and then we don't know, again, like I said, in this era of integrated service delivery, we don't know what other symptoms are there in the, in, in the chest. We have found uh, cardiomegaly. We have found a lot of things, you know, that we that that has has contributed to the health uh, of these people. So I, I feel uh, it's something that uh, uh, probably later we'll get to know <laughs> what, what 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 how to approach this. But but I know that definitely it has helped to 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 screen everybody since it is low dose and uh, uh, yeah. So that that's what I can say about this. Thank you. And what's the rationale of uh, engaging three teams uh, while you have only one system? Yeah, because when we go to a state, we don't move with the whole team. So we try to put, like I said, we have expanded to three states. So we made sure that we, we train three teams. But I would like to say that there are two people that are fixed in the team. There is the lead and then there is the person that operates the generator. They go to all the states. But in the states, we get... A number of people that have been trained before, we just absorb uh, two more from there and we're complete. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, and, uh, um, sorry, the next question is, besides AI reading, any medical doctor, non radiologist uh, also review the x-ray remotely? Um, well, uh, if you look at the algorithm, there is a point where people that come back to be bacteriologically negative are linked to medical officers. So here is a place where we are not able to be on top of the reviews because when this is done, uh, it's the medical officers that review them and then they might order for x-ray and it might not be our own equipment. So a, a, a certain number of the nomadic people go through this route. but. A good number of them go through our own radiologists right from the first four uh, points up there. I don't know if you're looking at the, uh, at, the, at the screen. Maybe if I take you back to where the algorithm is, you will see what I mean. So uh, like here, this, this area here, from the gene expert analysis of the samples taken, those that don't have TB, they go for clinical evaluation. This is not the radiologist in this area. It's not the radiologist. That's a medical officer, you know, that is, and we're not able to, uh, we can't say 100% of the people in this group are able to see the medical, because this, this, is a, this, is, this has been an issue from the beginning. But up there in the fourth option here is where we have our radiologist, who goes to review the x-rays after uh, weeks of activities uh, in the States. And then of course, he, he makes decision on this and the uh, people that are found to be uh, positive are put on treatment, over. Thank you. I'll take two more questions and we, we, we have some housekeeping message uh, and then we have to close. Uh, the next question is from Max. Are you planning to look at TB treatment outcomes? Um, definitely, because uh, the data that we have are segregated, uh, we can easily plug into the system and then of the NTP and extract, you know, uh, this data and then look at the treatment outcome. Yes, we want to look at the treatment outcome because we can't, we have to continue to build the evidence, you know. The earlier treatment outcome that I spoke about where we have 2 to 3% of uh, loss to follow up was from a study in one of our grants. Then the x-ray was not, was not there. This was in 2011, 2012, you know. So now it's good to also look at the treatment outcome of the people that we have in this particular uh, intervention. We're going to do that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you conducted the study uh, to decide a use of threshold of 0 0.3 um, and the sensitivity specificity at both thresholds. So the this is a repeated question, uh, not really a study, but that's uh, yeah. based on experience. Um, yes. But um, before we, we, I see we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to just uh, give a last chance to our participant live if uh, if they have any if you have any question you want to speak up uh, and discuss you can and raise your hand now uh, and uh, we'll still give you a few more minutes to uh, raise your question
in the meantime, I'll just notice that, um, okay, Jemu, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Jen. Uh, Dr. Steven, uh, thank you for the good work that we're doing up there in the Northeast, and uh, kudos to the team for this uh, achievement. However, I would like to call your attention to the fact that uh, NTBSCP in Nigeria is actually planning to scale up uh, procuring uh, portable digital X-rays for states across the country. So I will indulge you to work closely with the uh, program managers across the state where you work uh, so that you can work with them and share experience with them and uh, engage them properly on uh, how to implement up there because uh, you can give them that technical support since you have the experience already. And uh, thank you once again for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, good point. And uh, Dimitri. Uh, hi, very nice presentation. And I have a question. So will this data be anyhow later available for analysis like for AI and et cetera? Yes, uh, definitely it's going to be like uh, this one that I presented today for the six months in 2022. It's already uh, has already gone just gone to the publishers and uh, we have some presentations to make at the Union Conference in France on it. And uh, the one that we're doing now that we expanded to the other states is also being developed and we are also going to uh, get it out uh, published. Very well. Thank you. Yes, on that note, exactly, uh, Jacob, who's the head of the TV Reach team here at Stop TV, funded, supported this project, just left the comment here that that data on accuracy, the paper will be published soon in a few days. Um, if people are interested, it will be on BMC, the Global Health, uh, Global and Public Health Journal. We, if it's available, we can send the the, the article along with the recording of the presentation. And speaking of the union, I think uh, uh, you will be interested to know uh, uh, there is a workshop that uh, SubTV and USA uh, jointly put together uh, on the 14th of uh, November as the official program of the union. The title is called Programmatic Implementation of New Screening, Diagnostic and Digital Health Digital Solution to Decentralize and Strengthen TB Detection. So this workshop will feature the country experience on the use of ultra portal X-ray and CAD, as well as TrueNet uh, and diagnostic connectivity solution and that are introduced by uh, from this uh, um, INTP introducing new tools project. Uh, the time of the workshop will be from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. only in the morning. Uh, we will send a link in the chat uh, to access the uh, registration of the workshop. You can already register now. If you have uh, registered for the union this time, we can also send again the flyer uh, about the workshop along with uh, the presentation recording. So um, I think if there's no other question, we're also at the time. Um, and if you do have other questions, feel free to keep writing in the chat. We, we can go and, and um, uh, work with Dr. Stephen to get them answered and send it back. So, um, and it has been really engaging. Thank you so much for participating. And, and, and there are a lot of questions. It's a very uh, uh, interactive section today. And I also want to thank Dr. Stephen for giving this very informative presentation and, and, and sharing your experience here with us all. Um, so um, stay tuned, maybe we'll have another present uh, webinar in the near future back in quarter four uh, this year. Um, and and then thank you for joining the webinar and take care. Thank you very much, Eugene. Thank you, Shihab, Jake, and the team.